Hello, everyone. John Drummond here, host of the TNT show, Wednesday nights, 7 p.m. And do we have a treat for you tonight? Join in and listen to Michael Gray. You can hear all about Scotia and so much else beside. See you tonight, 7 p.m. Hello, my name's Steve B, and I'm a presenter on Indie Live Radio. I present music and musings every Friday night at 7. The music, that's 70s classic rock, although we will take the occasional side road. The musings, well, they're thoughts on Scottish independence, politics and world events from my viewpoint, which is that of a grumpy old man. So join me every Friday night at 7 on Indie Live Radio, a new voice for a new Scotland. Hi, I'm Fiona from Clackman and Show Women for Independence. Did you know we have a podcast on Indie Live Radio? It goes out at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, repeated at 6 o'clock on a Thursday. Uh, come and join us for some news, views, opinions, the odd poem. It'd be very nice to have you with us. And come and hear the news you're not getting. Hear some new voices for a new Scotland at Indie Live Radio.
Hi there, I'm, I'm Clough. And I'm Russ. And I'm, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a program out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot. Hello, good evening. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TNT show, The Nation Talks. It's, you know, it's been another great day for British democracy. I watched on ITV Boris Johnson telling a group, a classroom full of rather astonished and astounded children today uh, that there was absolutely nothing they should be worried about in terms of COVID-19. That's a revelation to the rest of us, but uh, the, the kids were uh, suitably impressed not uh, also, today has been Jers Day. Everyone, these brothers and sisters, talking about Jers. I want to make a recommendation to you. Before uh, you listen to too much more about Jers, you really want to try and get a copy of this book. I, I know it doesn't come over terribly well, but it's called The Deficit Myth, and it's written by a nice lady called Stephanie Kelton. Uh, do get a copy of that, because I think it will help enlighten the debate, if I can put it that way. I'm John Drummond, and your host for the next 60 exciting minutes. And thank you for joining us this evening. We have yet another great guest. You were promised great guests on the show, and we've got them. Uh, and I'm really excited that he's with us tonight. Stay tuned to hear about starting up a new platform for online campaigning and so much more besides. We're going to be talking about the media, about politics, and about the law. This is your chance, because this is your show. The nation is talking and it's your chance to put questions live for the next 60 minutes. You should take advantage of that, I suggest. So, to our guest tonight, The Nation Talks, to Michael Gray. Tell me, Michael, how are you coping with the COVID-19? I'm all right. I'm keeping cheery. Good. And, and what do you do to keep cheery? I don't know. If listen to fine online media like like yourselves. Um, I think it's it's got better the more you can see people again. To be honest, hasn't it? Once once you know the first kind of month and a half started to get by, and you were allowed to go outside a bit more and socially distance and meet up with some family and friends again. I think that lifted the spirits. Mm. Yeah, I think that's worked for all of us, frankly. Um, tell us a bit about yourself. A bit about your background, where you're from, uh, uh, your education, your early career, all of that good stuff, so well, that people I'm, can get to know the, the man behind the face tonight. Well, I'm, I'm six foot two. Some, some people have described me as lanky. Um, I suppose I'm originally from the West Coast, if you're wanting to, to do the geography. So I grew up um, sort of around Bear's Den, not far from, from Glasgow. Um, and I suppose the the more interesting stuff than, than height or place of birth is probably the fact I got involved in the independence referendum. I was involved in sort of writing and campaigning a lot during that 
uh, that important democratic event. And since then, I've worked in, in journalism and then more recently did a, a law conversion at the University of Edinburgh. So I've still been involved in a lot of writing around important political matters in Scotland. Um, so, yeah, politics, media and the law. Yeah. Well, and what about your family? What's your family background? Uh, well, I'm back visiting them at the moment, actually. So I won't say anything too cheeky uh, since <laughs> we're just in the room next door. Um, but no, we had a good chat about this actually preparing for the show, didn't we, John? We were talking about um, that they're both teachers. Was growing up in a, a family of teachers, I think, is always a, a privilege in lots of ways. And you get a lot of good things from teachers, whether they're good teachers or bad teachers. I think when you're, when you're young, they might not always be all your favourites, but I think they always leave an impact on you one way or the other. So I think that was important to me growing up. Yeah. And you didn't want any time to go into teaching yourself on the educational system? Not formal education, um, but I think in, in some ways, journalism is about storytelling. It's about telling a good story that resonates with people, that shares different ideas, and for me, hopes, hopes for a better type of politics, a better country, a better world. Yeah. Um, and that is, to, to me, that's the type of teaching, that's a way of sharing things that are educational and, and helping people learn about the world um, in, in hopefully a positive and constructive way um, that isn't always restricted or, or narrowly just about what takes place in classrooms or educational institutions. You know, so it's quite a, a cliched phrase now, lifelong learning. The idea that you're always, whatever age you are, no matter where you are, where you work or what you do, that you can always be involved in learning and learning more things. And I think you know, in some ways we can all be involved in, in helping teach people things as well. What would you say is the purpose of education? Um, oof, that's a deep one. Um, I don't know. I don't think, funnily enough, actually, if we're going to be funny about it, I don't think I'm quite qualified to answer that question. Um, well, you're you know, a consumer. I, sorry? You are a consumer. <laughs> <laughs> a consumer of education, yeah. Well, so I, I think that's, that's the beautiful thing about education, why it's so important, is that it can mean many things to different people and lots of people shape it around what they care about, their own sense of both individual pursuits and things they care about and community interests and sort of community um, things that are important to any community. So for some people, I think they would consider education a matter of, of skill and expertise the idea of like amassing almost like a, a library of personal knowledge and understanding and competencies. But I think for other people, and, and I think this is in some ways a more attractive concept of education, it's, an, it's a civic idea, it's an idea of communitarian strength and endeavour, and in the fact that through understanding things as a collective or as a community or as a group, obviously the outcomes from that process, whether it's you know, how a factory works to produce something or um, how a street or a tenement works to, you know, do stuff around the community and make sure everyone's okay. You know, those types of how we learn together is how we sort of uh, achieve more important things as a community. And I think, you know, without, without schooling, you know, we all, a lot, most of us go to school and learn those things as, as a group. And obviously we can't thrive as a society. Yeah. How well do you think Scotland does in those terms? Um, I think it, it does education unequally. Yeah. And what do you think the consequences are of that? We're unequal. Yeah. I think, um, you know, you don't have to be Einstein to, to know that often there is a two-tier system in terms of education, most prominently between the private sector and the state sector. Um, we, we often trumpet the value that undergraduate education in Scottish universities doesn't have tuition fees and the idea that wealth shouldn't be a barrier to opportunity. And yet the private school system is obviously designed for, um, for families and people with the greatest wealth, the access to greatest opportunities in terms of school education. Um, and 
you know, there's different ways that we could do something about that. I think it's a shame that the non-domestic rates um, exemption that was about to be equalised between private and state schools was um, was U-turned on due to the pandemic. Uh, that's a, a small example, something that could be done quite quickly. Yeah. Um, but more broadly, obviously, we just have to aspire to, to think, why, why should any child's opportunities be determined by the wealth of their parents? It shouldn't be. I was talking to Billy Kay, you may know, who's written about... Scotland, and he has very interesting and, and strong views on education. Uh, and he felt he benefited enormously from the Scottish education system and also for it, from its inadequacies, because he, he tells a story about when he went to school in Ayrshire, he spoke one way, but at nine o'clock he had to change to a completely different way of speaking. And he said it gave him the facility for languages. <laughs> that wasn't his intention. <laughs> its intention was to rather derogate Scots as a way of talking, uh, but uh, or, or rather diminish it. Uh, I, 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 but the reality was, that in him, it, 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 he felt invested with an ability to move between languages, which has stood him in great, in great stead, you know, which is, which is fascinating. I'll apologise for a first plug, but I can't, can't help it, is because um, Billy Kay was in it. It's a really good documentary um, on the Scots language by a young lad called Ali Heather, um, and it's called Rebel Tongue. And so, for anyone watching, I think it should be available on, you know, if you're a, even if you're a BBC critic, it's on the BBC iPlayer, um, and it's done by a guy called Ali Heather. It's called Rebel Tongue, and it's really, really great. Um, and Billy Kay's a good chunk of it is in is in there. Um, and Ali's a great young up-and-coming journalist himself, and he does, one of his great passions is the Scots language, and he's done a great job of promoting that through his documentary. Excellent. Were you on that? Nope, just a, just a happy oh, viewer. Okay. For a friend, as it were. Okay, that's great. That's super. So can people get this on YouTube? Because it might be I think it's still on, on BBC iPlayer. It's got, and he, he does a, a wee tour around Scotland himself. He, he okay. goes to Tanadice uh, in the United match. He's up talking to Frankie Boyle. I think he's down in the board, down the borders, I think. So he goes all around the place and he's, um, yeah, he's, a, he's a good guy. Excellent, excellent. So look out for that, folks. It's called The Rebel Tongue and you'll get it on the BBC iPlayer. And it features Billy Kay. All good reasons to tune in. So, I mean, at some stage you must have got into politics. Did that happen at university or before? But maybe in the womb. <laughs> so your, your folks are political? Uh, well, yeah, I think I, we, this is something else we touched on the other day. I think, you know, everything's political in one way or the other. But, I, yeah, I, don't, I, I think one of my... I can't remember much about, you know, Blair in 1997, but, you know, I certainly, you know, remember like talking about politics when I was growing up and just paying attention to those types of things, uh, particularly when I was at high school. So um, after um, high school graduation, I went to, to study politics at the University of Glasgow, which, you know, another, another thing about being born in 1991 meant you were just that perfect age for the few years before the referendum to be, to be starting to be involved in in the sort of national political debate. Um, so I couldn't ask for anything more fortunate than that. What's your view on what's happening in the States just now and what might happen in November at the election? Oh, in the US? Oh, well, I think cer certainly one thing in, in some ways about America that will become more frustrated about probably over the last decade is, is the limits of electoral politics. Um, um, uh, you know, I was I have I've been, I was lucky enough to visit some friends in the states when I was a bit younger, just leading up to the 2016 or the year, year before the 2016 vote. Um, and I don't put a great amount of faith in the establishment of the Democratic Party to combat a lot of the the worst attributes of the, the sort of American political and economic system. And um, so, while obviously I hope Trump gets his jotters. Um, you know, I'm far more more inspired by the likes of uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez um, from New York, and obviously the Ber Bernie Sanders campaign. And most people I know in in the states um, are far more inspired by the type of politics represented by the Sanders wing of the Democratic Party around um, issues like uh, Medicare for all, basically having having a type of NHS. 
um, and and that type of politics, um, rather than the slightly more the moderate, moderately reformist um, Biden platform. Yeah. I mean, said all of that, it's tough for people like Biden. It really is because I mean, I remember the first time I went to the states uh, and I was having my hair cut in Minnesota, and the barber was terribly nice, and we were doing a bit of sharing, a bit of male bonding and stuff. And he said, "Where are you from?" And I said, "Oh, Scotland." Scotland, Scotland. Is that near Sweden? And I said, "Sort of." Yeah. He says, "They got socialism there." <laughs> what do you make of that? And clearly, he didn't make much of it. So, so I was circumspect in my response, but it, it 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 demonstrated a truth for me, which is that it's an enormous country, and uh, even though Minnesota was described as Democrat, farmer, labor, uh, it it went through its own changes. Um, and anyone studying American history will see that there have been cycles of which this is one. It's almost typical uh, of going through a period of uh, saying to hang with everything. Let's just go for this guy, <laughs> even though even though someone like Trump might not appeal to people outside the U.S., he, he does resonate with an enormous number of people. And of course, the other irony is that the he won because of the electoral college votes as opposed to the popular vote, which he lost. And the electoral college was established, as you know, to prevent. <laughs> <laughs> a demagogue from becoming president. So the best laid schemes of mice and men. The founding fathers got lots of things right, but not not perhaps everything. So you went to university in Glasgow, is that right? Yes. Okay. How did you feel about that as an educational establishment? Fortunate. I, I still um, love a lot of things about Glasgow Uni. Actually, I think uh, yeah, it's it's it's. It's a, a great place. I think it does pretty well with contributing to the sort of common good of the city as well. I think a lot of people involved in the institution take that seriously, and that's something that that holds it close to my heart. Yeah, good, good. And, and then you got into political journalism. How did that happen? Yeah, so I think, um, well, while I was at university, I was quite lucky to be involved in, in sort of political events, be it sort of public speaking and debating and writing. And when it, well, after the SNP won their majority, the inevitability of the independence referendum obviously became the, the talk of the town. And as someone who'd always kind of considered themselves to the political left, um, it was really the first time that I'd been seriously in, engaged in that sort of debate over Scotland's future. Yeah. Um, and so that sort of dragged me into a whole set of opportunities to write and to become involved in campaigning. So um, I was, after, after writing about independence, I was asked to get involved in National Collective, which some people might remember um, from these um, olden days. And um, that, that then sort of dragged me into the, the fun and ferment of the referendum campaign. Yeah, yeah. What did you think of the Yes campaign? I think... It was fantastic and beautiful and brilliant. Um, it was, I, th- I think still to this day, a lot of people, you know, or a certain segment of people, maybe particularly within political journalism, to be, cre- to be cheeky, are slightly um, bitter and kind of a little bit holier than thou and snide about how they talk about the Yes movement. Um, I think they they have a kind of um, sensible um, stenographers of, of the truth approach to journalism, whereas there's this kind of mobby, like belief there's this kind of mobbish mentality about, about normal people who engage in politics and do it and, and use their own voice to do so. And I think too often, you know, politics is kind of controlled by a small elite of people who are quite fortunate that they're often very well educated, often fairly well off or very well off, um, and do so in this slightly polite and condescending tone to, to the rest of society. And I'm, I'm not a fan of that. I think what was great about the Yes campaign or the Yes movement broadly is what it was just all these community events and all these people finding their voices mm. and becoming involved in public debate 
in a way that they hadn't before and with a confidence they hadn't before. And that type of sort of public confidence and belief in the democratic process is for me the foundation of any good society, unless you have a belief that you are equal to anyone else and that you can debate and that you can discuss and that you can make decisions. Yeah. In my view, you don't have the basis of a, of a true or equal democracy. And Glasgow, for me, was a real epicenter for that, particularly in that like summer of 2014, in the last few weeks. You know, people that were there in George Square or Sucky Hall Street or even other parts of the city, you know, um, will probably never forget that feeling of the energy and the hope that was there on the faces of so many thousands of people that had never felt like that before. Um, and, you know, um, it's coming yet. And obviously that, that feeling and that momentum will, will return um, when Scotland does become independent. Why then did it fail, you think? <laughs> well, because we won Glasgow and lost the country. <laughs> um, I think today is a very important day to reflect on that, though, because ultimately I was, I was just rereading the fantastically named uh, Project Fear by Joe Pike, which is an inside story on the campaign that left um, a kingdom united but a country divided, is how it subtitles itself. And, and it, it describes in very close detail why the No Campaign won. And they won because, uh, well, they, in some ways they lost the campaign and they lost the hearts of so many people and, and the hopes of so many people. They did enough to persuade moderate, economically cautious Scots that um, there was a lot of risk and uncertainty with a large political change. Yeah. Um, and the main reason for that was the economy. And we all remember the kind of economic messages of concern and worry about jobs and currency and capital flight. And for me, that, that was also the key reason why independence came up short and um, reaffirms the importance of us reaching out and understanding people that still have those concerns and doubts because it's all so easy for us to just surround ourselves by people who agree with us and, and pat each other on the back. Yeah. There's even some people I speak to online that say they don't know anyone that opposes independence. Um, and that must be quite fortunate in some ways. It must be quite um, reassuring that everyone around you agrees with you. Um, but in some ways, that should be a sign of worry. If you don't know anyone that disagree, disagrees with you, um, find people that do and try and understand uh, what, where they're coming from and, and understand how someone could be persuaded because if we don't do that, obviously we just sort of remain um, entrenched on two sides of, of a Western front that we've, we're never going to cross. Um, and for me, that's, it's really difficult. It's a really, really difficult challenge to do that, but it's absolutely vital that we do. Well, th this, is, this is my chance to put in a plug then. Because next week, we'll be talking to somebody who uh, completely disagrees uh, with the idea of independence. Uh, she's a candidate for uh, Alliance for Unity. Uh, you don't want to miss this next week, because she's going to come on and tell you that everything you know about uh, independence is wrong. And uh, furthermore, she sees independence as threatening. Uh, so you really want to tune in because it's not about it's not we're outside the silo now. <laughs> so and I, think that's, I think that's great. I think more yes, like platforms that are pro independence need to do that. And we'll get on to talk about Scotia hopefully later. But we are really keen to do that as much as possible because we need to focus the debate more on those more on people that are either not yet convinced or are open to changing their minds. Um, and we'll talk about that now. There's a lot to yeah, celebrate. That's, that's, There's a lot to celebrate being at 55% or in one poll, um, but it will go higher. It, it can go higher, but it, it, I mean, the likelihood is that, I mean, the, the driver for me in interviewing somebody who's opposed to independence is dead simple. And that is, let's assume that the Scotland becomes independent tomorrow. Uh, the folks who are on the other side of the debate will be enormously valuable in that new Scotland. They have to feel part of that new Scotland. And you don't feel part of anyone, of anything, if someone shouts at you. Uh, the, the, the time to lay down the foundations for a united country 
uh, post-independence are now. And we need to reach out to people who don't agree with us and say, let's talk. Because if we're talking, there's a chance that we'll reach some measure of understanding. If we don't talk, we'll never reach any measure of understanding. So uh, if you've got a question to put to our guest next week, you should do so. <laughs> because uh, I, I'll, I'm hopefully going to ask her some questions that uh, would help to elicit some of that uh, deeper understanding of how, why people feel so passionately opposed to independence. And I suppose one nice point on that is I think a lot of people assume that voters for unionist parties are themselves unionists, and we know that's not the case. And most recent polls show that now as, much, as many as 42% of people who voted Labour just last year now support Scottish independence. And, and I think there's a huge opportunity to, to bring a large majority of the Labour vote on side. Well, and also I'd like to feel that there's a, a proportion of the right wing vote mm. that is presently thinking seriously about how they would like to position themselves in independent Scotland. Uh, I mean, it, it, as soon as the numbers go above 55%, a head to or 60%, it, it, you know, it, it beggars belief that business people don't look at that and say, you know something, <laughs> we have to hedge a bet or two here. Otherwise, we're not, we're not business people. And I think other people on the right wing will probably take a similar view, which is that I don't want to be last in the party. Mm -hmm. And uh, the likelihood then is you get splits uh, with pe some people who feel they're progressive but not conservative, let's say, uh, but right wing. See, I, I would like to put in my 10 cents worth in this new state because if I leave it, then somebody else will take my place and my chance will have gone and it'll be very difficult to recover. And in fact, John, it's not just us saying that today. It's also um, Kenny Farquharson who's a writer with the Times uh, newspaper itself, Unionist Leaning. And he wrote in his column today that he kind of considers himself an ambivalent unionist, yeah. um, not a kind of table-thumping red, white and blue unionist, but someone who's kind of on balance, thinks there's a kind of utilitarian argument um, for, for the UK. But he says to himself and to his audience, at what point does it become more important to make sure that this is a success yeah. than it does for us to just kind of stay in a, a safe space among a kind of growing minority, a, small, a reducing minority of unionists? And he talks about the 60% threshold being a place where it almost becomes self-defeating for people who are ambivalent unionists and the Labour Party, for instance, to just say, oh, no, we're not engaging with this. We're just going to be no, 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 and we're not going to put forward any coherent ideas. I think these two things are related, the economic discussion that we just had and the engagement with people who are, who are currently still critical or on the fence. Because I think there's a lot of positive ideas that, for instance, Scottish trade unions could put forward in terms of like economic reform, in terms of economic sovereignty and, and what we do with Scotland's sort of great assets and economic opportunities. As you say, there's people in the business community as well that can become more engaged in these discussions you know, Scotland has so much going for it in terms of natural and human resources, in terms of great universities and research institutions, in terms of people that have great experience of monetary policy, of international credit markets, international borrowing, um, of central bank development. And that's the work we're going to have to do as a country together, irrespective of what camp people were in before the referendum. Yeah, and certainly as far as the right wing concerned, there must be a whole, some people, maybe a substantial number of people who are conservatives but not unionists. Mm. Uh, and uh, I mean, the reality is that once an independent state is created, it, 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 it generally looks nothing like the version <laughs> that people thought it was going to look like before independence happened, because independence itself is a process. It, it's not a, I think some people view it as a switch. In other words, a switch goes over at midnight and bingo. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's absolutely no uh, guarantee that the first government of an independent Scotland, or certainly the second, would be SNP, for example. Mm. Uh, people, the whole point of being sovereign is people make up their own minds. Uh, and, and, and with sovereignty invested in the people, which was one, what one would hope for in an independent state, 
then people are contrary. They, they make up their own minds. Uh, they may say one thing before independence, but they could feel di very differently afterwards. And the process of moving from being part of a unitary state to being a separate state will involve choices. And not everyone is going to agree with some of the choices that are made or maybe a substantial number, who knows? And therefore they will want to express that concern in the new state. And they'll have a blank sheet of paper to write on. And that, I think itself will be hugely interesting. It'll be great for politicians, I have to say, and polit political journalists, because <laughs> I can imagine theses being written all over the place. Uh, because mm -hmm. this, 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 uh, sorry, uh, this raises a huge challenge for the Yes movement. Um, and it's something I described recently as the challenge of becoming a national majority. Yeah. And because obviously the last month has been really historic, something that lots of people have dreamed of for all their lives. Independence is now becoming um, the settled will of the Scottish people. Um, arguably for the first time in 313 years of it being, you know, either a not a non-democratically expressed view, there being no democratic institutions, yeah. or being expressed as a minority perspective. Yeah. And I think being a minority for centuries creates a certain mindset and it creates like the belief that you need to, to battle, to fight for relevance, respect or recognition. You have a sense of being marginal um, in many ways, particularly within national and certainly within British institutions. You know, you're not being reflected necessarily as a serious political view. Um, and that's changed because independence is no longer a position of outsiders. It's a position of the majority. It's normal. It's popular. It's no longer an eccentric position. It's no longer the underdog. Um, it's particularly, of course, popular among young people. It's becoming a kind of just a normal, um, accepted, almost like celebrated point of view. Um, and that means the movement has to take responsibility and a certain type of responsibility for that change in the national mindset. When you think about the language we use, the approach we have to politics, because we're the people that are going to be responsible in one way or another for the creation of the world's next independent state. And that's a huge responsibility because it's the responsibility of creating new institutions, the challenge of negotiating with Westminster to make sure it works. Um, so we need to behave, I think, with a new sense of authority, of confidence, but also maturity. And the quote um, that I used to describe this is the quote from the late great trade unionist Jimmy Reid um, that he used to address the Upper Clyde ship world, uh, shipbuilders uh, work in in 1972, I believe, when he said to them, the world is watching us and it is our responsibility to conduct ourselves with responsibility and with dignity and with maturity. And I think that's a message for Scotland today um, because we're not just dealing with ourselves and getting over the line. As you say, we all have to work together after independence. Um, and I hope it's not too patronising for people of that, this opinion, but people who are unionists are in an incredibly weak position because they don't have new leaders. They don't particularly have new ideas. They don't have the support of very many young people. All these things are few and far between. And we shouldn't be viewing these people as kind of powerful enemies that are out to get us and that are going to like undermine the national project. Because I think it's becoming clearer month by month that the national project is becoming, is on a roll. It's becoming more and more popular, hopefully an unassailable majority. And so we need to be, I think, it's, it's, it's a huge change, it's a huge challenge, I think, particularly for people that have obviously had to face all this, the jeers and the sneers sometimes for decades and decades and decades. Yeah. Um, to then sort of start, you know, biblically turn the cheek, turn the other cheek and say, and, you know, be the bigger person because you now represent the majority viewpoint of our country and we need to be responsible in how we exercise that newfound popularity and say, right, okay, you're against this, you feel threatened by this, you feel your identity is threatened by a, by a change in the UK. Well, yeah. I understand that and empathise with that, but I want you to come with us and achieve the changes that we want to achieve to, to our country. And I think that's a really difficult change in mindset that I think I'm only just starting to think about myself because it's only really started to crystallise in the last few months. But I think that's arguably one of the biggest challenges the Yes movement faces between now and independence. Which begs the question, I mean, I would agree with most of what you said, if not all of it. What is independence? Because here, here we are talking about what an event 
a process. Uh, and it seems to me we've never quite defined it. We have talked about uh, the enormous opportunities, uh, perhaps, but we haven't actually said to the world and to ourselves, and particularly to those who are presently opposed to the whole idea, this is what the new state will stand for, and this is what it will not stand for. We haven't done that simple thing. We haven't drawn up a contract between the new state and its citizens and the world. And it seems to me we've been remiss in not doing so. But I, I, that's just a personal opinion. <laughs> but if you want to define independence in a couple of seconds, feel free. But I want, I'd like to take some questions, if I may, because we've got a whole bunch of folks who have written in. Uh, I'll go to JD on uh, YouTube, and he's saying, do you think JERS is backfiring on the unionist parties? It's pretty obvious it's exposing the mismanagement of the UK government, uh, who've been running up this debt on our behalf. I quite like the, the Robin McAlpine quote, um, which is essentially that the unionists have kind of made a mistake by putting all their kind of views and hopes and ambitions onto a simple kind of accounting accountancy exercise. Yeah. They said, you know, they've put in all their faith in an abacus um, and you can tell because you can listen to how much they kind of squeal in discomfort when you try and take the abacus away from them. Yeah. Um, and I think, so there is a certain truth in that, that, you know, the, the debate over some, a country's economic, economic future isn't based on an expenditure revenue analysis on, based on single years within the current framework, obviously. Yeah. If you're a unionist, you have a broad view of an idea of pooling and sharing and cooperation that is far, far more about any one government or any one set of statistics. And likewise, on the independence side, you have a belief in sort of democratic decision making of Scotland yeah. as a country and our ability to vary and use those powers more effectively. So, yeah, I think it is a mistake to um, believe either way that any figure wins the debate. Uh, for me, it, it's a mistake in the same way that in my humble opinion, that the Yes campaign made a mistake. In other words, uh, in being resolutely positive, uh, what it does is it makes you a sort of one club golfer. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to have some negative stuff in your armory. And I think for me, what was noteworthy is the Yes campaign almost nothing negative to say about the, the debate. And, and that, that's, that's a trouble when you have the other side is almost entirely negative. But, and, I, and I feel the same way about about this sort of debate. But uh, another question's come in from, uh, we've had a stack of emails, by the way. Uh, <laughs> here's one. <laughs> Linda Hendron on Facebook says, when Scotland gets its independence, do you think that Scotland would benefit with the younger generation making up our new political parties? Um, new political parties, I suppose. It would be interesting to see. So I've not really even thought about that much, like what would happen to the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Democrats. I suppose it would probably be a mixture, wouldn't it? It would probably be the kind of younger generation that are already in those parties that might take a, more of a public role. Um, you know, the likes of, you know, Monica Lennon seems to be, you know, spoke up in favour of the democratic right to have a, an independence referendum. I know Paul Sweeney... Um, Kind of did the same, um, and they're kind of more in their in their thirties, um, I think. And yeah, so I think there would be a generational change in in the unionist parties after independence. I think that's inevitable, unless someone breaks ranks now, <laughs> and I mean pretty much now, uh, in the next couple of months, then it will be over to new people to form what will now become new parties. I suspect. Uh, here's a question. Uh, I for Scotland. Uh, what currency should Scotland have post independence, and why should it be an independent Scottish currency rather than sterling? So, uh, I'm a bit of a, a heathen among people who are, are kind of to the left in, in Scottish politics, in the sense that um, I'm in many ways disappointed with some of the kind of binary presentation that there's been around the Sustainable Growth Commission. Um, I think there was a lot of good work in the Sustainable Growth Commission, particularly around, not to deviate too much, but around sort of migration, around sort of economic 
investment and understanding and, and fiscal control. Um, and I think it's kind of been, obviously there's been a, been a focus on criticising the Commission's work on the basis of its proposition of keeping sterling um, in the immediate aftermath of independence and then having the six tests. Now, I think it's important um, to think about that seriously. And I don't, and I wasn't someone, um, despite being to, to the left and in some ways thinking that the Commission could have done a lot of work on other areas of economic uh, development um, the, that, was, that was overly critical of that approach. Um, I think more work needs to be done on developing macroeconomic, a macroeconomic agenda for an independent Scotland. And that means more research on the nature of central banks, on the issues of the international credit markets, on the restrictions on borrowing, both under sterling and during a transition to an independent currency, because that's hard work. The reason that the sort of serious commission into these issues came up with that slightly on the fence answer of sterling after independence and then a transition to an independent currency when optimal uh, and when beneficial is because that's a huge administrative undertaking and um, which um, is a serious issue for financial institutions, for anyone that's got a pension or a mortgage or a business of any form. And so I'm not keen on some of these slightly flipping or baby with the bathwater throwing exercises, which acts as if there's a single word answer and the, or the, the louder you assert sort of one macroeconomic position, the stronger it is. There are strong arguments for an independent currency and um, that relate to sort of fiscal flexibility and freedom and the ability to borrow and invest to the appropriate um, degree that's needed for the economy and not having to have an arrangement with the Bank of England, for instance. I think those are strong arguments. Um, but as it stands, I don't see the academic work or the planning for that proposition. Um, and so at that stage, it seems that all the work as the, contingent, the plan A, contingency plan, would be an agreement with the Bank of England in the immediate aftermath of independence. Yeah. Stephanie Kelton said that would be disastrous. But anyway. <laughs> to be dependent on another, uh, um, she goes through all the countries that have failed, Argentina and others, uh, depending on somebody else's bank to look after them. If you don't have money from sovereignty, uh, you could be, I think, as one American's president said, in deep doo doo. But that's something we can return to perhaps with Andrew Wilson, who's also coming up on the show in a couple of weeks' time. Um, question uh, from uh, I want to make sure we get, we, get we, we, I put this question precisely. It's from Fiona Graham on Facebook, and she's asking, what is your view on QAnon and the way it is infiltrating into this country? Uh, as far as I know, because uh, a good friend of mine uh, called Alistair Davidson, who's a kind of yes activist and really a great guy, I think originally, I think he's back in Mary Hill these days in Glasgow, and um, posted about that earlier this week. Um, it's kind of a, a, a US, I think, sort of hard right conspiracy theory type thing that's kind of populated around the internet. Um, and so I think that's that's kind of a question about conspiracy theories and misinformation. Okay. I think it's dangerous and, and bad. And I think a lot of the time these things can can sort of seep into the public debate because people have an understandable scepticism of authority. Um, and rightly, if you know you look at most of what the UK government has said, for instance, over the past decades to justify wars or to justify its economic policy or public sector cuts and things like that, you have an understandable scepticism of what authority figures and government say sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, and I think certain kind of malevolent People often try to take advantage of that um, and spread often quite sort of dangerous misinformation. I think part of the important role of, of new media organisations like yourselves or the work that we're doing with Scotia is to counter that and to say, yes, of course, you shouldn't just trust anything, everything that the mainstream media says about things. You should do your own research and your own work. Um, but we have to be equally, if not more critical, of just you know, unsourced or unverified information that could sometimes be coming across um, social media platforms as well. And um, we should never lose our, our independence of mind. Yeah. Uh, good point. Neil Scott on Facebook is asking, 
does the SNP have a decent opposition? And does it undergo proper scrutiny, either in the Scottish Parliament or in the media? No. Yeah. No, no to both, I take it. There is no decent opposition. I don't think currently there's a, there's a decent um, opposition political party making the running. Um, no, and, and I think also most of the scrutiny in the media is often quite um, skin deep. Yeah, it's, it's tabloiding. If it bleeds, it leads. And that's not terribly informative, um, it seems to me. Uh, and it's also not very good for the media. You know, if, if you go tabloid, you have to understand that it, it, it's a council of despair. You're actually saying, I'm going to give up on a whole bunch of my thinking audience in order to shift. <laughs> For me, what's a good segue onto the media, because we haven't talked that much about the media, um, is that I think one of the reasons people can often get so frustrated at the media um, approach to the Scottish government and the SNP, and I think you see this particularly in a lot of the, the sort of daily briefings, yep. is that it's all this kind of gotcha moments and all these kind of just trying to trick someone um, and, and get you know a cheap headline about Christmas or a cancellation or about a U-turn and this kind of thing, rather than about what people are most interested in, which is you know the, the material consequences of political yeah. decisions in their lives. And I, I, I have always had a concern that I think the media, a lot of mainstream media journalists and institutions see their job as a watchdog of power, and by that they usually just mean government power. And they don't really see themselves as having what we started the conversation with, a kind of educational role to showcase and encourage debate and new ideas and new thinking, i.e. solutions, something that people are actually quite interested in. And so all I've worked in in media when I was doing reporting at Common Space or writing articles as a columnist for The National, or what I'm now leading on, which is the work I'm doing with Scotia Media, um, which is Media for a Better Scotland, Media for an Independent Scotland, is all about, yes, yeah, sometimes you have to be critical. You have to say there's this area of public policy where things where there are problems. And we all know there's lots of problems in, in Scotland. Mm. But not just doing that, because I think that's lazy, you know, just to, to point at things where things are going wrong. I think everyone has a responsibility, particularly the media, to also point to potential solutions to what people are suggesting could be done better and how to do it in a straightforward way. And in some ways, I was doing that on such a repetitive basis that I got, I bored myself senseless because almost, you know, I eventually stopped a column for the National. I felt like I'd written so many columns for the National saying, replace council tax, do more land reform, and push forward with rent controls and connected to housing quality because what will these things do? It would have a more equal country. It would have more accessible, high quality, safe housing. And it would give more people access to land and and for business opportunities and, and sort of better community development work. Like these, they're not the sexiest things in the world to keep saying or necessarily the most exciting. But hopefully anyone, no matter what political persuasion is listening to the show, can think, well, I may or may not vote the same way as him, or I might like what he, his criticism, or I might not like it. But you can at least see that you're be, someone's being practical about what they're criticising. They're not just interested in being out to get someone. So tell us how Scotia is going to meet that need by combining a sensible independence of the media with a determination to create a better country. Um, and so Scotia Media, for anyone that's not aware, uh, not aware of it, Scotia with a K, S-K-O-T-I-A, um, our group came together just a year ago. It was myself, Robert Somney, um, Ruby Zajic, and more recently Liv McMahon and Jenny Constable as Media for a Better Scotland. And we're an online campaigning journalism group that supports Scottish independence and a better yeah. country. Um, all three of us are sort of in, in our sort of mid to late 20s. We're quite young. We're doing it as, as volunteers in our spare time. We've produced over 150 videos on a huge range of topics, mainly about politics in Scotland um, over the past year. And it's had over a million views, mainly on Twitter, um, but we're also on Facebook and elsewhere. And the common theme of all our work are those, those two areas, the, the, the idea that we want a better country, there's things that obviously we're, we're concerned about and that we're critical of. We think the countries, broadly speaking, everyone's got their own individual um, views on these things, but the country's too unequal. There's too much poverty. There's, you know, too much, you know, poor housing, not enough, you know, high quality, well-paid work, those kinds of general concerns that I think a lot of people share. Um, but we also 
have views on how we can um, help alleviate those problems. One of the general views being that we think Scotland would govern itself better as an independent country. Um, and that's been going quite well. We've seen over a million views on, our, on, on the work that we've done. A month ago, we launched a, a Patreon, which is a way to sort of grow the organisation so people can you know, chip in um, you know, five or something like that a month. And watch this space. It's going to get, it's going to get exciting. I think we're, we're, we're going to put a call out for more people to get involved just this week so we can grow from, from the small group that we have to something bigger and better. And I'm really excited about what we can do because ultimately I personally see the organisation as an organisation that can help win independence for Scotland. And have you, I mean, has the mainstream media plugged into what you've been doing? To an extent, yes. Um, I know because of particularly like Robert Somney, who have, who's a great journalist, uh, particularly on sort of international affairs, a lot of mainstream journalists follow the work that he's done and um, the work I've done as well. And so a lot of people, I think, in, both in government and in, main, in the mainstream media are following what we're doing. Um, one of the interviews I did in, in January with um, the former Justice Secretary Ken McCaskill was picked up by the Press Association and, and put across the wires um, as they're described. So they were was reported in various sort of mainstream um, outlets as well. So yeah, we're we're keen to influence uh, the the mainstream media debate as well. Here's a question that came in uh, from uh, Bella Baxter. Uh, she's saying, question from Michael: How do you think we build an alternative media in Scotland? Obviously, Scotia is a large part of that, but leaving Scotia aside for a second, uh, not just for the nationalist movement. Uh, and how do we prevent the legitimate rage against the old media turning into a Trumpian anti-media phenomenon? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. I think if I'm if I'm right in saying from the, the username, I think that's a, a message from Bella Caledonia and the editor Bella Caledonia there, um, which is obviously as well an absolutely fantastic uh, campaigning journalism writing website. It's got a lot and and media group as a whole, um, and has done great work on those two areas that that question outlines. And um, itself, actually, it's far more developed. Bella has been going far longer far longer than we have and is quite well established. And one of the projects that's launched recently is a kind of new writers, new journalism funded project um, to encourage new voices from diverse backgrounds to get involved and to submit work that usually wouldn't be showcased within the mainstream media in Scotland. I think that is a perfect example of, of how you achieve exactly what um, the question um, aspires to, which is you need a more diverse media. You can't just have the same people talking to each other there's a, and the second part is a danger that you kind of just create kind of angry echo chambers. Yeah. Um, and I think there is a risk in that. That, I think, relates quite well back to the discussions in the wider movement. Um, what we're involved with, I think a lot of what you yourself, John, set out recently is about being positive. It's about being open to new people and new ideas. There's a lot of anger, particularly online at the moment, um, and frustration. Um, and I understand that for many reasons. You know, we're, we're stuck with a damn awful Tory government that we didn't vote for again. We're stuck with a damn awful Brexit that, we, that Scotland didn't vote, for, didn't vote for and is set to kind of intensify around December. And it can sometimes feel like there's a kind of managerial approach at the top of the Scottish National Party. Um, and I think a lot of people in the movement are frustrated at that. Um, I think some of the editorials actually that Bella Caledonia has, has published on this have been right on point, which is, yes, yeah, stay critical and, and push the SNP leadership to do more. So there's practical answers for that. For instance, the First Minister said that they would set up a Scottish Constitutional Convention in January this year. That was obviously pre-COVID and that set a lot of timelines back. But that has to be a priority again. Um, the discussion on the economic case, which Andrew Wilson and others, Alec Neil, raised recently, has to be um, updated for post-COVID and promoted inclusively, not just decided by a small group of people. Um, and the focus on the right to choose and a route to independence has to be a priority and a big tent campaign uh, during the next May's elections. And I think if you do those things and you encourage the leadership to do those things, and um, then you can alleviate some of the frustration. 
Um, so I think people, it's understandable that people are frustrated and, and wanting um, more active leadership. I wrote a piece for Bella Caledonia again called um, a, a New Legal Strategy to Win Independence for Scotland. And um, some of that is about pushing the constitutional boundaries of um, the Scotland Act 1998, taking a more adversarial approach to the Conservative government. If we take an issue that's, that will be present in a lot of people's minds, the death of Mercy uh, Bagaruma, um, the, the, the mother in Glasgow who was found dead in her flat with her one-year-old child um, just the other day, who's clear, in my view, um, someone who's just been let down by the Home Office and the asylum system, who's been denied the right to work and abandoned into deprivation without financial support and then found dead and having come forward weeks before without money to feed herself and her child. You know, this is the type of emergency situation, humanitarian emergency, that should create a humanitarian emergency response from Holyrood and, and bring forward legislation to provide greater support to people in the greatest need. Um, and there is a risk, of course, that that legislation would then be challenged by the Conservative government legally. And they would say this is out with the competencies of the Scottish Parliament. The same arguments, incidentally, stand true for the drug death epidemic. Um, horrific cases of people not getting support because due to the stigma of drug use, they're pushed outside the, the health system by criminalisation and often found dead where they live. Um, and you know, enough is enough. They've stood aside the Home Office and blocked plans for safer consumption rooms, for instance. And no matter how hard all parties have tried to engage with the UK government, they just say no. Well, fed up waiting. The movement is fed up waiting for action as well. I'm fed up waiting in these types of cases. And the Scottish government should bring forward framework legislation to allow for these types of services to be delivered by local authorities in the Scottish government. If the UK government want to take this to court, then that puts them in the dock because that shows that they are the inhumane barrier to progress and social care in Scotland. Because these are people's lives. These are people dying in Scotland today because of the structures we have in place, for instance, for people who suffer from drug addiction or for people who make applications for refugee support. And it's not good enough. And it's not good enough to wait any longer. And I think that would bring everyone, it would not only be the right thing to do, not only be the just thing to do, it would also bring people together, people that are frustrated about things going too slowly and not combating the government at Westminster and people that want a more gradual approach to bring more people together. Because yeah. everyone would see in Scotland at that point that it is the Scottish government standing up for social justice and that they're prepared to fight and it was the Tory government and the constitutional system specifically that is the best. And so that's what I, that viewpoint can gain traction and popularity. This is not the time for despair. And while people may frustrate, feel frustrated, it's a time to act and to call for greater action, not to walk away, not to split, or as, as Bell, the editor, I believe, Bell Caledonia was saying in that question, just to get angry about it without any sense that there are solutions. We do have options and we do have solutions. Uh, I mean, I assume, I mean, it's not, it's not for me to speak for the Scottish government, because, uh, but thinking about the sense of what you've just said, isn't it likely then that they would point out that it would be impossible to, to do what you suggested because the law officers would not support it? There are well, two, the, the, there the actual... And the executive may wish it, but the administration may say it's ultra varies and we just can't touch that. There are two possible directions. So I'm proposing what they already did with the EU continuity bill. So you obviously would have to frame the legislation in a way that the Lord Advocate would sign off on that yeah. or any future Lord Advocate if the current Lord Advocate was replaced. Um, and that's a necessity. So that happened in the case of the continuity bill, which was over the EU powers issue. There is no power of veto to passing legislation in the, Scottish in the Scottish Parliament once you reach that stage. The presiding officer holds no veto. It's, that's only the, um, the demonstration of an opinion. And after it is proposed and passed by the Scottish Parliament, the UK government is then in their court to decide whether they put in a legal challenge to it or not. So that is the crucial thing. Either the legislation 
is then not challenged and receives royal assent, in which case we have shown political leadership and courage. And I think a lot of people out there who are frustrated at the moment just want to see some more courage. I want to see some more courage on these things because it's, I'm not just designing these this, this strategy because we want some legal disputes. No, I also want to just show more political courage and show that we're willing to, to take, take these people on. Um, and if it's not challenged, then that's great because we've shown some courage and people know we're serious about this. And, you know, I spoke to someone, and well, I've mentioned Mary Hill twice tonight, and Mary Hill, who said he just didn't really believe what we said as a movement because he did a lot of work with the drug recovery community and he said people weren't really there to support them. These people need to see someone fighting for them. And either it's passed or it's challenged. If it's challenged in the courts, then fine. And we have the legal fight and they can't hide in the dark anymore. Yeah. And what we shouldn't do is just sit on our hands. Yeah, uh, I think you've put that point very eloquently. Uh, as you have done with all of the questions tonight, Michael, uh, I've enjoyed your discussion. I'm sure the audience has too, because we've learned a lot. Uh, and it seems to me that the role that you and Scotia and all the others that you've mentioned tonight is vital because people look at the opposition, they say, these guys are just ambulance chasers. What we need is a real solid uh, opposition that actually puts together positive suggestions for change, not just saying, hey, I didn't like what you just did. Anyone can say that. I mean, that's not opposition. That's the opposite of opposition. That's, uh, as Elliot Boomer pointed out in his column, in the Sunday National last week. Thank you very much. We're always coming to an end. I do appreciate everything you've said and I hope people will uh, become subscribers to Scotia and hopefully uh, contributors and investors as well. Uh, a big thanks to all of you out there. Uh, I can see the, the sun's going down rapidly, so you might not see as much of me as you saw at the beginning. I, I apologize for that. Uh, big thanks to Michael. Big thanks to all of you for watching tonight because you're the folks who make the show and you've really made it tonight. We've had loads and loads of questions uh, and we've tried to fit in as many as we possibly can. I'm sorry if your question didn't get, uh, didn't get chosen. We, again, as always, we have a formidable list of guests coming up. Uh, next week is a cracker. Uh, the Yes Movement sometimes is accused of talking to itself. Next week, we're going to break the mold completely. The TNT show is reaching out across the political divide. Uh, to talk to a candidate for the new Alliance for Unity group. And our next guest is Linda Holt. Linda is wholly opposed to independence. You don't want to miss this show. It will be a cracker, as I say. Join us next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for the Nation Talks to Linda Holt. Oh, I, I look out for my Constitution column on Sunday. And support Indy Life, please, at all times. Thank you again, Michael. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Good night. Hello everyone, John Drummond here, host of the TNT show, Wednesday nights, 7pm, <laughs> and do we have a treat for you tonight? Join in and listen <coughs> to Michael Gray. You can hear all about Scotia and so much else beside. See you tonight, 7pm. Hello, my name's Steve B, and I'm a presenter on Indie Live Radio. I present music and musings every Friday night at 7. The music, that's 70s classic rock, although we will take the occasional side road. The musings, well, they're thoughts on Scottish independence, politics and world events from my viewpoint, which is that of a grumpy old man. So join me every Friday night at 7 on Indie Live Radio, a new voice for a new Scotland. Hi, I'm Fiona from Platman and Show Women for Independence. Did you know we have a podcast on Indie Live Radio? It goes out at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, repeated at 6 o'clock on a Thursday. Uh, come and join us for some news, views, opinions, the odd poem. It'd be very nice to have you with us. And come and hear the news you're not getting. Hear some new voices for a new Scotland at Indie Live Radio.
Ellen, you can watch this again, you can be part of it. It's Independence Live, yeah. A few people asked about YouTube, it'll be YouTube forward slash Independence Live. That's where you'll find the footage. No Westminster, come on. No Westminster, not for me, not for me, but therefore I'll be your slave. I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, freedom, come on. Hi there, I'm, I'm Cliff. And I'm Russ. And I'm from, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a programme out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot.